Hi, this is Ed Mount with Grace Bible Study in Bernie, Texas. And today's Bible study is titled, Will We Have to Suffer? And uh, we're going to start out not covering that subject, but we'll get there. Will we have to suffer? Uh, I think a lot of us Christians are afraid of suffering. <laughs> Many of us are afraid of dying, unfortunately, because for most of us, we realize that dying is a quick passage to glory. But, oh, there's Tammy. She's here today. Hey, nice to have you here, Tammy. Uh, let's go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, where it's Paul writing to the Philippians, and he says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons, grace be unto you and peace, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's writing to a local church or a local assembly, which is the part of the body of Christ that meets in that area or that meets anywhere. Anywhere you've got people that gather that are true believers, you've got the body of Christ or the church, which is an assembly. And... Uh, so I just wanted to make the point that it, the church is a group of people that believe not a building that they meet in. In fact, in many cases, they don't meet in buildings. Many of the believers in Africa meet under a tree, That's the only, and yet they are a church. So is this letter just to the bishops and deacons? If you'll look back and see, he addresses it to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. So he's not sending it just to the leaders, not just sending it to the bishops and deacons. And what that proves for us is that the word is more important than the leaders, is we should always follow God's word. Uh, because a leader could be an error. I could be an error. How would you know? Or even be able to check it. Let's go to Acts chapter 17. verse 11, where Paul had been teaching in what we now know as areas, or they knew as parts of Asia, uh, all the way over to Greece. And in, in Greece, there were the, the, he says, these, which were the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. In other words, they listened to Paul and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. What a nice and simple thing. If we could all do that, if every assembly or church in Christendom uh, suggested or encouraged the people that attend to check them out with the Bible, boy, we'd have some real meetings and a lot of questions. We, we don't get to ask many questions in a regular church-type meeting, but that's what we would need to be doing, and somebody like me would have to answer the questions if I was asked, say, well, wait a minute, why do you say this when the Bible says this? The Bible rules. Every individual is responsible to know God's word so that he doesn't follow a leader blindly. And until you know God's word, you better hope your pastor is leading you correctly. So Paul sends his letter to all of them, not just to the leaders, to all of us. That's why I always refer you to the verses that I cover, and then I uh, give you my understanding of it. But I may be mistaken in something, and that's why you get the verses so you can check them out for yourself. Check me out. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, where it says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, Paul is saying to the Philippians, Always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So we are blessed to share fellowship in the gospel with fellow believers. Uh, Annette and I can remember our time together with believers 
all the way from San Luis Potosí, Mexico, to Memphis, to Little Rock, to Sheridan, to San Antonio, uh, as well as all those we have come to love through family, friends, visits, or even on Facebook. We pray for you all and welcome your prayers for us. We sure need them. We are all united in Christ, all of us fellow believers from all over the place. And what does that make us? Part of the body of Christ, part of the church. We will see each other again. Meanwhile, do we have to worry over those that are far away? Let's go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he's going to continue until the day of Jesus Christ. So when did this work begin? Because he says from that point, he's going to continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. where Paul starts out speaking about himself and his fellow teachers, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. You can't trust what you don't know. And what's the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the Holy Spirit that indwells us when we become believers, which is the earnest or the assurance, the down payment, you might say, of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. We're the purchased possession, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ unto the praise of his glory. So we, we were immediately sealed with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our eternal inheritance. And what else happened on that day? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 12 and 13, and then 27. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, and that spirit is capitalized, that's the Holy Spirit, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been all made to drink into one spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then verse 27, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So we're baptized into the body of Christ did and who are we baptized by the holy spirit do you think he needed any water <laughs> no he didn't need any water uh let's uh go on to second corinthians chapter 5 for the uh, the other amazing thing that happened at that very same moment that we believed all this happens is when we believe that jesus christ died for our sins was buried and then rose again to be with the father for he hath made him, meaning, I'm sorry, Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, so that he is God who made Christ to be sin for us. He took our sins. Who knew no sin? He never sinned, but he took all our sins to the cross with him, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Wow. So he took our sins and he gave us his righteousness in him, though. We're not righteous apart from him. We're righteous only in him. And um, now the question is, is this imputed righteousness or is this practical righteousness? Now, imputed righteousness means, did the Lord consider, or you might say, stamp us as righteous <clears throat> because we trusted in the Lord and what he did for us on the cross. And practical righteousness is, did we immediately become perfectly righteous, perfect behavior, never a bad thought, never a bad word? And of course, we know 
that it's imputed righteousness. God considers us righteous. We are righteous in his eyes, but our behavior is not always righteous or our thoughts. And that's why the Holy Spirit will continue to work in us. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. We were talking about this uh, last night in our Bible, local Bible study that we have here. And uh, something that as I've grown more and more in my knowledge of the Lord and his word, uh, I just made the point that I used to think that at, once I became a Christian, that I used to do some bad things and some good things. But now, well, that I used to do some bad things and some good things. And as I've grown, I've come to realize that everything I did was bad because I was only in the flesh. I was only thinking in carnal manner. So everything you do when you're in the flesh is no good. And so that's just something you realize as you go on. You weren't a wonderful, almost perfect person that got saved by the Lord and now you're perfect. You were never anywhere near perfect. So what the the Holy Spirit starts working on is in Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23 where it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So this is the fruit of the Spirit. This is not our fruit. We're not able to will ourselves to be more loving or more joyful or more peaceful. This is the work that the Holy Spirit will continue in us until the day that the Lord Jesus Christ comes for us, which would either be that he actually came to get us or it would be our death when we go to be with him. So what is that fruit of the Spirit? What it's talking about is we started out we didn't even know what love was uh, or joy or peace. We, we were, you might say, we were very deficient in those departments. And the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in us is increasing our peacefulness, increasing our long-suffering, increasing our gentleness, increasing our joy and our love. And as he does that, it starts to show on the outside. Uh, so... But the fruit is what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. And I'm afraid sometimes that legalistic religion turns it around to say that you have to make yourself more loving. And we can sure act more loving. But for us to actually become more loving is the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's not our work. So he's working on our character. He's changing our character. As our character changes, behavior will follow. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10 where the apostle Paul tells us for by grace you're saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God so we know this but grace is an unmerited favor it's a gift we didn't deserve and could never earn so we're being saved by a gift through our faith we have to believe in it in order to receive it but it's not of ourselves. It's a pure gift of God. We can never take credit for this. And in verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we can never brag. A, a, Christian should, a true Christian should be a man that has no pride in anything that he's accomplished and only points to the Lord Jesus Christ who accomplished it all. We don't have anything to boast. But we're saved by grace through faith, not by any works that we do. He makes real clear. Then in verse 10, he goes on to say, for we are his workmanship. In other words, he's working in us, created in Christ Jesus. And that's who we're created in, in the Lord. That's where our righteousness lies, is in Jesus Christ. Unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So his workmanship, causes or uh, creates us capable of doing good works. Now, that means that we are going to do some good works. But um, who chooses the good works? What if your pastor says, I'm going to let you park the cars? Or I'm going to let you fold the chairs? 
And these are the good works that God has appointed for you to do. That's not what it is. It's yeah, We have to wait and see what the Lord actually puts in front of us. He's working in us. He'll give us the good works to do. Let's go back to Philippians. <clears throat> Excuse me. Chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. And he knows this. He knows they're all believers. So even though he's writing from jail in Rome, prison in Rome, yet he has great comfort in that he knows that he and they belong together in, under grace. For God is my record, how I greatly long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. So think of all the true believers you have known. They are fellow receivers of grace which means that they are not trying to act like they're better than they are. They're not trying to act like they're better than you or me, which means they're easy to love. That's something Annette and I found so quickly when we uh, stopped to visit people, and some of them were Christians that were trying to be better than they were because they thought that was what they were supposed to do, and the others were Christians that willingly admitted that they were sinners saved by grace. So... And we think of people all over the place. We've had such a privilege, and we know people all the way from Mexico to Tennessee to Mississippi to Washington State to Hawaii, just people we love and know and are fellow grace believers with us. We're all in the same boat. We have nothing to brag about. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 28. where the Apostle Paul starts out by reminding us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us meet up to the glory of God. Instead, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And that's what we just heard in Ephesians. It's through Christ and through the free gift that is offered to us and through our belief in it that we receive it. And so when he's talking about Christ Jesus, he says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation or to stand in our place to take the punishment that we deserved through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So it's through Christ's righteousness that we are forgiven, not through our own. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier, this is all Christ, and now comes our part of him which believeth in Jesus. We're him which believeth in Jesus. So if somebody comes and brags to you about how good you are and what they think of you, say, sorry, my only thing I can brag about is that I'm him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law or without any works to make himself righteous before God. It's not a performance. It's all about believing in the performance of Jesus Christ. So the, the, let's, let's go back to Philippians chapter 1. And we'll say verses 9 to 11. And this I pray, says Paul, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. And it will, because we have the Holy Spirit working in us. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Of course, you could fight these things. But if you submit to them, this is what will be happening. <clears throat> Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So we love and pray for all you all that uh, we know and love from our past. And we know that one day we'll rejoice with you in the presence of the Lord. That's a pretty neat thought, isn't it? So sometimes we talk to 
friends and and loved ones and we wonder if we're ever going to get to see each other again on this earth but uh we will get to see each other again if we don't get to see each other on this earth so when does this work that the holy spirit is doing in us end let's go back to first corinthians chapter 15 where the Apostle Paul shows us something that wasn't previously known in the Old Testament. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, 51 to 57. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die because to, in God's eyes, nobody dies. We just are changed from this world to an eternal world we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so this is describing to us that final day when the work will be finished because all our lives will be the Holy Spirit's working in us, but we're never going to be perfect until the Lord takes us and changes us to immortal and incorrupt people. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory like it was for our Lord Jesus Christ that his death was his victory over Satan. So it is with us that our death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. So for all people that aren't believers, they should be scared to death of dying for sure because they have a, they're still under the sting of death. They're still under sin. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have nothing to worry about. Um, and we will be changed. And when will we be changed? Let's go to one other <clears throat> verse that describes this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, where there had been some questions about when the Lord was going to come get us and so Paul is answering he says but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep or those who have already died that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope so he's saying don't worry about the people that believed in Christ that already died don't think of them like those people that have no hope which died without believing in Jesus Christ for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them who have died in Christ. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So there's going to be a day where the Lord comes to get the remaining believers. And if that were to happen today, He's saying that's not going to prevent those that have already died from enjoying the same thing. He says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Man, what a day that will be. I sure would love for it to happen while we're here. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So all the believers that have already died will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So at that time, there's no more training needed. There's no Holy Spirit having to continue to work on our character because we have been changed into perfect beings in the presence of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's a wonderful thing to look forward to. But meantime, will we suffer? Let's go to Philippians chapter 1, 
verse 29 and 30. For unto you, Paul tells us, it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me, because Paul is suffering, he's in prison. So believers will suffer in one way or another. And of course, the Lord doesn't tell us everything in here as to exactly how, but we often, when we hear that word, we think of physical suffering. And uh, in some cases, extreme physical suffering like those who were burned at the stake, uh, even going all the way back to the apostles. Some of, uh, I think Peter, it said, was crucified. Uh, they suffered. But even, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 16 to 18 where the Apostle Paul tells us, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So maybe you don't think you've suffered yet. <laughs> well, don't worry. It's going to happen sooner or later. And if you get as, ho as old as we are and you haven't, then you're going to suffer because your body is going to start dying on you and you're going to suffer. And that's why he's saying here, though, even though your outward man or your body uh, perishes, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And that's our, that's our glory. That's our excitement. That's our joy because we can see that. We can see that we're growing inwardly day by day even as this old flesh we know is going to go down. It was designed to. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Many are distracted today by things that we can see that we don't like, but they're temporal. They're going to go. And the only things we should worry about is those things that are eternal. So, and there's other ways that you can suffer. Somebody was asking, well, how? There's emotional suffering through maybe betrayal or rejection. There's spiritual suffering, which is suffering for all those we know and love that don't believe. And if they make it to the end of their lives not believing, they're gonna go to hell. And that causes me a lot of suffering. That's just something that I have to leave in God's hands because otherwise... It would just depress me day by day. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But I would that ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So what happened unto Paul finally is that he ended up in prison in Rome. But he's saying it's, it's furthered the gospel. It's fallen out unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So there he is in prison. And yet because he is, Rome is getting to hear about the grace of God. So there is a purpose to our suffering. If through our suffering, like Paul, we also display our faith, it will further the gospel. So today, there are a lot of people that are afraid. Let your peace and calm give them hope, if you have peace and calm. If not, your faith needs a little tweaking. I read today that Ernest Hemingway said that we're all broken, and that lets the light in. So what he meant by that is that as we suffer and as things happen to us, we gain wisdom. He wasn't necessarily referring to spiritual wisdom, but wisdom. But God has a better statement about that. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 7, where he says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world, who is Satan, 
hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So that's what we really are concerned about is the, the, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ shining into them. But when they're proud and self-righteous, that can't happen. For we preach not ourselves, says Paul, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when we become broken enough to turn to the Lord, to know that we need salvation, to know that we're sinners, then his light shines into us. That's what lets that light in, that truth. And then he says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not us. And I think that is so neat. Uh, let the, the light of the Lord shine through us so people can see both our humanity, that we're a broken pot. That's how it's through those cracks that that light shines out and our faith. Your faith in suffering demonstrates to others the excellency of the power of God, whom we trust in the most difficult conditions. Let us be the calm in the storm. Or are we trusting him only when things are good? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. where uh, the writer says, now faith, faith, that's what counts with the Lord is our faith, is the st substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, faith for us should be the substance of things hoped for. We know we're temporary down here. We know we're going to heaven for an eternity. We know our future is guaranteed. But it's the evidence of things not seen. Well, it's the evidence to non-believers of things not seen when they see our faith uh, in action in difficult circumstances, when we are the calm in the storm. But if we're whining and crying like them, all they can see is our lack of faith and see no difference between themselves and us. We're not a very good testimony for the Lord. I hate suffering. I say, Lord, please take me out of here. My, my father died in his sleep in the night. What a blessing that was for him. But it should comfort us to know that the Lord will use our suffering to the furtherance of the gospel. So even if we're not out there being great uh, preachers or whatever, if we have faith in our suffering, the Lord will use it to the furtherance of the gospel. And that, of course, that suffering is only temporary. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Our suffering is only temporary, and the Lord will see us through it. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 31, 31 to 39. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Ask yourself that question in these difficult days for many. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's us. It is God that justifieth or justifies us. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Not unless we let it. 
As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long, says Paul. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, through Christ. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an amazing road we have to walk uh, this time that we're still on earth. Let's praise God for it. And then finally, Titus chapter 2. Verse 11, 11 to 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. When we're really suffering severely, Let's look all the more for that appearing of him coming to get us. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So let's be looking for that blessed hope as we continue our walk through this earth. Thanks a lot for listening. Hope this helped.